המחשבות והרעיונות שאפשר להמשיך ולהחזיק תחת כיבוש. זה תחת כיבוש. אז אפשר לא לאהוב לא לא את המילה, אבל מה שקורה זה תחת כיבוש. להחזיק שלושה וחצי מיליון פלסטינים תחת כיבוש, לפי דעתי זה דבר גרוע. זה לא יכול להימשך ללא סוף. אתם רוצים להישאר תמיד בג'נין, בשכם, ברמאללה, בבית לחם, תמיד. In August of 2005, the State of Israel carried out then-Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's plan for disengagement from the Gaza Strip, which entailed the evacuation of approximately 8,500 Israeli civilians from the coastal territory. The majority of these Israelis resisted the pullout. Though in the end there was no bloodshed and relatively little violence, the disengagement was a significant strain on the soldiers tasked with the mission, and also for Israeli society in general which engaged in a heated debate over whether the disengagement should take place, and if so, how it should be conducted. As for the settlers who had been residing in the Gaza Strip, many had viewed themselves as the vanguard of Zionism and the ideal of greater Israel. Israelis from the National Religious Movement, which generally emphasizes the importance of greater Israel, were well represented among the constituency of the Gaza settlements. In addition to this ideological glue that held much of the community together, the barrage of attacks endured by the Gaza settlers during the Second Intifada further strengthened the sense of social cohesion and community resilience while also reinforcing the pioneering sentiment championed by many of the settlers, who saw themselves on Israel's front line with its enemies. That their commitment to the state was met with such an affront to their ideals was perceived as a true abomination. To many of them, the disengagement was a grave betrayal. As a result of the disengagement, settlers lost their homes, property rights, communities, and employment. Realizing that the transition would be difficult, the Israeli government sought to provide a cushion by passing a series of compensation schemes into law in the form of the Gaza Disengagement Implementation Act. This law provided monetary compensation for losses in real estate, residence, livelihood, business ownership, as well as for costs incurred in moving. The law also provided non-monetary compensation such as counseling and physical help with removal of property. A later addition to the law authorized the creation of a national center commemorating the Gaza settlements, which is also a form of non-monetary compensation. Much of all of this was carried out by an agency dubbed Assistance for Settlers in Gaza and Northern Samaria, that being the English translation. The acronym translates to SELA. This agency was established in the Prime Minister's office and is directed by an official appointed personally by the Prime Minister, so it really is the hand of the government here. As I noted before, the majority of the settlers adamantly opposed the pullout, despite the compensation offered. The tactic chosen was to dig in, fight, and get the government to reverse course. This was done in many ways, protests, demonstrations, public awareness initiatives, right-wing news media such as Arut Sheva, and the internet. The most prominent website identifying with the struggle against the disengagement was Katif.net, named after the largest cluster of settlements in Gaza, Gush Katif. It started as a PR tool to document settler life in Gaza and promote sales of local produce, and also as just a normal social outlet including discussion forums, weekly Torah commentaries, and other features that made it a popular online hub for Gaza's Jewish community, and a proper example of how close-knit that community was. But when the disengagement plan made it to the news, Katif.net began to serve as the main online headquarters for residents and outside supporters resisting the evacuation. Activists used the site to discuss tactics, share viewpoints, raise funds, express solidarity, and post photos and videos of protests. So Katif.net can really be seen as a sort of digital projection of the Gaza settler community across time, during life as usual before the disengagement commenced, during the evacuation when the settlers mobilized in opposition and resistance to the plan, and even in the years following. To this day, the site exists as a memorial to the struggle against the disengagement and the community that was evacuated. It also operates as a popular online tool for helping dispersed evacuees keep in touch, post political updates, get information about employment opportunities, and other purposes. There's another website worth mentioning, and that is the site for the Committee for the Settlers of Gush Katif which was established before the disengagement to assist and represent the evacuees in various ways. According to the site, the committee is the sole organization recognized by all government bureaus as the legal and official representative of the communities of Gush Katif. The 
committee also maintains an American branch known as Friends of Gush Katif, which is a 501c3 organization focused on fundraising campaigns for assisting the Gaza evacuees. Some of the committee's activities are providing scholarships for students, planning youth-oriented events, lobbying. For example, the committee succeeded in introducing amendments to the Disengagement Act, allocating more compensation to business owners, specifically farmers. They also provide professional training for evacuees seeking new professions. They're overseeing the design, construction, and maintenance of the Gush Katif Legacy Center in Nitsan, and other forms of commemoration ranging from memorial forests to board games to an official day observed in participating schools involving special activities and lessons. So each of these websites represents a different aspect of the Gaza settlers. Katif.net is the community as a collection of people united by experience. And the committee website represents the group as a collective with interests, grievances, and demands. Something interesting about these websites is a somewhat strange coexistence between celebration of a specific ideology, Zionism, alongside a very palpable disappointment and even defiance of a government that's supposed to be the product of Zionism, that being the Israeli government. Really just by virtue of its past function as an activist headquarters during the disengagement, Katif.net obviously portrays a message about Gish Katif as not only being a tragedy, but also being an unwise, unnecessary tragedy. The committee website, because it deals with the government in order to aid the evacuees, is also in a way antagonistic to the state, even though it tries to be non-political. Though the aesthetics of the site do suggest a certain political sentiment that we may assume to be in opposition to disengaging from territory in the future. It's also worth noting that the government's handling of the evacuees has been considered to be subpar. על פי הנתונים שהוצגו בכנסת על ידי המתיישבים, 45% מאלה שעבדו בגוש קטיף הם מובטלים. כאן בלשכת התעסוקה באתר הקרוונים ניצן מנסים לעזור, פותחים קורסי הכשרה, אבל השורה התחתונה היא שכמחצית מהאוכלוסייה עדיין לא עובדת, ומכאן הדרך למרפאה שממול קצרה. גם שלא עובד ויושב בבית, בסופו של דבר יפתח את התסמינים של הדיכאון. Various reports have come out demonstrating that many evacuees have suffered from depression. They weren't able to find employment quickly enough. Many remain unemployed, and those that have secured employment often make less than they used to. They didn't receive compensation quickly enough, and many had great difficulty getting into permanent homes, as some still do. את מקומם הקבוע, חלקם עדיין לא נקלטו בעבודה, בתעסוקה. Because the Israeli government not only evacuated the Gaza settlers against their will, many of them at least, but also mishandled them afterwards, there really is a growing stratification, it seems, between the community and the state. As of now, um, we're just, you know, don't have any faith in the institution that represent this country. Not the government, I, I for myself, not the government, not the, the Knesset members. Not the juridic system. I have uh, very hard feelings towards the army, towards the police uh, officers, and it's very hard to relate. Still, the, I, I'm very much related to the land of Israel. It's clear that many of these people are still committed to Zionism as it relates to the people of Israel and the land of Israel. But it's worthwhile to really examine how this community specifically, and also the greater community that it represents, perceive the state of Israel. Here I want to reference two articles that I read while researching this topic. The first is titled, Fundamentalism in Crisis, the Response of the Gush Emanim Rabbinical Authorities to the Theological Dilemmas Raised by Israel's Disengagement Plan. Inbari basically traces the development of the Gush Emanim movement as representative of religious Zionism and comments on changes in the movement in reaction to not only Gush Katif, but also to events preceding Gush Katif. Though early Zionism was largely a secular movement, there was a relatively small religious movement within it that was spearheaded by Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, who to this day is really seen as a sort of prophet of religious Zionism. Rabbi Cook made the claim that the secular Zionists were pushing for a Jewish state because they were being driven by a Jewish impulse for redemption, and the whole Zionist movement is a sort of covert divine scheme for bringing about the Messianic Age. Now, this narrative was relatively easy to adhere to in the state's early years. You had the nascent Israel defeating the invading Arab armies in what was perceived to be a miraculous victory in 1948. And then 19 years later, Israel triples its size after the Six-Day War, coming closer to the biblical borders of the Promised Land. And of course, the Six-Day War resulted in the reunification of the holy city of Jerusalem and control over the lands of Judea and Samaria, which are considered to be the cradle of Jewish civilization. 
They saw it resulted in a nationalist fervor in Israel, especially for people who were anticipating the Messiah. Seven years later, the Gushemani movement was founded as a political movement pushing for settlement of the land. But over time, the Gushemani movement has been forced to question its sacralization of the Israeli state. In 1978, Israel signed a peace accord with Egypt that included an expression of willingness to establish Palestinian autonomy in the territories. In 1982, Israel withdrew from the Sinai and evacuated several settlements there. In the 1990s, Israel engaged in the Oslo process, which was designed to lead to a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, and Israel withdrew from parts of Judea and Samaria as part of its peace agreement with Jordan. All of this has led to a gradual emergence of dissident voices in the Gushemanim camp expressing exasperation with the Israeli state, though at first these voices were marginalized. With the Oslo process and the Gaza disengagement, it has become more and more commonplace for Gushemanim rabbis to voice the opinion that the state of Israel has perhaps served its purpose and is now acting contrary to the divine mandate. As such, it must be replaced by a theocracy either gradually through demographics and political mobilization and or through public awareness campaigns and outreach. We originally came to Israel in order to make, to, in one sense, not just for ourselves, but also to change the government to fit our ideology, which is a religious Zionist ideology. Uh, the government has taken, I think, a drastic step backwards in giving our land to Arabs. It's not the first time the government has done this in Israel. A similar article that I read is by Lily Weisbrod. It's titled, Coping with the Failure of a Prophecy, the Israeli Disengagement from the Gaza Strip. It was published in the Journal of Religion and Society in 2008 and analyzes how national religious Gaza evacuees have coped with the disengagement from Gaza as a challenge to their worldview. Weiss brought comments on many different reactions she documented, several of which involve some kind of distancing from the state. To this day, I refuse to sing Hatikva. I don't raise the flag on Independence Day, just the orange flag. The state cut itself off from its citizens, the disengagement. In some cases, this entails recognizing that, again, the sacredness of the Israeli state has been corrupted and the government must be taken over by demographic growth or just rejected altogether, as seems to be the case with a fair number of the so-called hilltop youth, a term applied to settler youth in the West Bank who ascribe to an ideology involving the restoration of Jewish theocracy and a contempt for Israeli state authorities, which are often antagonistic to their activities. The most interesting and troubling phenomenon is that of militant severance from the state which entails active rebellion. This notion did exist during the lead-up to the disengagement from Gaza. They say they'll stage a bloody showdown that will leave soldiers and settlers dead in the streets. A democratic state can make decisions and should not be afraid of a minority that will try to prevent it. I think Israel is much stronger than all those threats. The Peace Now activists turned out to be right. The Gaza disengagement was bloodless and not all that violent. But then there was the evacuation of the West Bank settlement of Amona. It was at Amona that rebellion really first took root. And it's notable that it was young people who were at the helm of this much more aggressive, though unorganized, resistance. The majority of the protesters are under 18. Their last stand highlights the existence of a new generation of passionate young believers. And just recently, during the start of the settlement freeze, we're hearing more and more about rabbis who are declaring that soldiers should not evacuate settlers. We're seeing more scuffles in the West Bank. And we're also seeing a quiet acknowledgement of the possibility that aggressive resistance is the only way, especially based on the experience of Gush Katif. In Gush Katif, there was a struggle. There was an attempt to look good and come out okay. In Amona, there was a struggle. And I want to tell the government of Israel, don't play with the blood of Jews. It's not a game. The residents of Outpost and the Shomron sacrifice their lives to build up and develop these communities. I estimate that people will fight for their land, like a wounded animal, and the responsibility for what might happen is on the government of Israel. I demand the government of Israel to refrain from bringing the nation to civil war. You know how it starts, but you never know how it will end. Think it through. What happened in Gush Katif was child's play. There appears to be more and more talk of this. Here's a blog that I recently found out about that advocates very violent resistance to any attempt to withdraw settlers from the West Bank, 
along with advocating for the establishment of a Jewish theocracy as the answer to the illegitimate and occupying Israeli state. This fellow explicitly calls for violent resistance and provides extremely detailed information on how to carry out such a campaign, how to organize cells, how to raise funds, how to recruit support from evangelical Christians, what kind of agriculture and equipment best suits sustainable settlements that can endure the strains of conflict, what kind of weapons to buy, how much they cost, what kind of training is needed, and more. It's fair to assume that most religious Zionists would not adopt a strategy leading to civil war, but if we're talking about the power relations and interaction between communities and societies, then it's worthwhile to get a comprehensive take on religious Zionism much and how elastic the ideology is, because the movement may soon undergo a real crisis of faith. Challenging events may be in the pipeline as the settlement freeze concludes and talks resume on prospects for pulling out of the West Bank and even possibly East Jerusalem with all of its historical and religious significance. If there's suddenly a vote of no confidence, then this has implications for the army, for example, as a state institution in which the national religious camp has some real leverage. It's estimated some 50% of the army's infantry junior officers are religious, a number which is growing rapidly. So for Rabbi Haga Lau, the army spirit should be more religious. So in closing, the disengagement from Gaza and its aftermath raised some very important questions about the interaction between a state and an ideology that might be having increasing difficulty imposing an ideal upon that state. In many ways, this really nicely illustrates the tensions and mechanisms that we're trying to examine and understand in this class, and it's my intention to take a closer look at this issue in that context.